So I got to tell you, it has been a challenging couple of weeks for me. I had to travel. And you know how all those other people that travel can be? They can be trouble and difficult. And then a person that I work with came up and tried to micromanage the stuff I was supposed to go do. You know people like that. And then we had people coming over, workers at the house, and they didn't finish on time. That was awesome. I mean, the last couple of weeks, it's been what I've called the week of thems. All those thems out there that kept making my life more trouble than it should have been. And then in the midst of all these thems, I get assigned to go prepare a sermon for Reformation Sunday, which is kind of one of the big deals in our church year. Oh, thank goodness I have other thems in my life. Good thems like my brothers, Pastor Roger and Pastor Leland, who came to my rescue and told me they would write the Reformation sermon for me. That was wonderful, and I can't thank you enough, Roger, for doing that. So my job today is really pretty easy because all I really have to do is just, uh, well, you know, read it. So here we go. <clears throat> today is the day in our church year when we celebrate the Reformation. All right. Grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone, Christ alone. This is our Reformation motto because Reformation Day encompasses the bottom line in our Christian understanding. Really, Roger? Bottom line? You had to put that? Was that necessary? Bottom line. Sorry, folks. Let me continue. <clears throat> the Reformation was started by a man named Martin Luther. He was a Catholic priest working in Germany, a beautiful country where most of the people worked on farms and told farm stories. You let Le like they still do today in Stanton, Iowa. You let Leland put that in there. Why, uh, farm stories, are you kidding me? It's Reformation Sunday. This is the sermon you guys wrote for me? Bottom line and farm stories, this is going to be embarrassing. Okay, I'm going to continue. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> and so, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, good grief, Roger. You're going to pull that out? We're going to start the sermon out with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Are there any more cliches coming that I should be aware of before I get to them? I mean, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, farm story. Uh, Brothers and sisters in Christ is so generic. I mean, it's used like a hundred times in the New Testament. And don't you think that phrase lost its meaning a long time ago? People don't identify themselves in that way anymore. People identify themselves in a far more personal manner these days, brothers and sisters in Christ. How about greetings to you, parents of preschoolers? See, now that would speak to the challenges and stuff we got to wrestle with in our day-to-day -day lives. How about peace to you, children who have excessive homework, right? That would speak to troubles that we have to wrestle with all the time. How about greetings, retirees, and those still in the workforce? Or better yet, uh, greetings, church volunteers, and fine caregivers. See, that speaks, Roger, to our distinct identity, something unique in us that we want to hang on to and know about. You get the idea. Uh, or better yet, we could make it even more personal. Good morning, Scott and Terry. Greetings, Marsha and Jonathan and Ginger. Hello to... Uh, Pastor, me. What? The sermons, on the, family of God. the sermons on the family of God. Well, of course it's on the family of God. That's what you preached on last week. You're trying to help me out with the brand new sermon. You're just going to give me the same stuff we had last week. I'm going to read it. Everybody's going to say, well, that was Roger's sermon from last week. That wasn't very helpful. I don't see now. I see why it was so easy for you to suddenly volunteer to. Look at the text. The text. All right, well, look at the text. Oh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Are you trying to tell me that the Reformation is about family? 
I don't, the Reformation is not about family. It's about Martin Luther banging 95 theses up on the church door. It's about indulgences. It's about we can't earn our way to heaven and nothing good that we can do. Only Christ can do it for us. That's the Reformation. Family, Reformation about family. Seriously? The Reformation begins with family, Roger? Well, I, maybe. I mean, I, I know. I mean, I know the Bible, right? I mean, I know the story of God and his people begins with family. I know this family was the central image of God and his relationship with his people and I guess kind of our relationship with each other. And yeah, I mean, I see here where you're right. God did create Eve because she didn't, he didn't want Adam to be alone. And the psalmist would go on to write that um, God sets the lonely into families uh, maybe, you know, Adam and Eve were the first family and families do become the structure of all of creation. In fact, when you think about it, the whole book of Genesis is all about families, right? Adam and Eve and Noah and Lot and Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. Oh, and then Genesis has all those names, right? Remember the begats, the begat, the begot, the begats, the begats, and all those lists of people? Ah, oh, but those are names, aren't they? Names of real people. Names of real people just like you and me. Those names tell us that we are important to God, both individually and collectively. And, and the family, I guess, extends our lifespan beyond our years here on earth. The family connects us to all those who have gone before and it connects us to all those who are still to come. You know, maybe you and Leland have something here, Roger, huh? Let's keep going. Because you're right, God promises to Abraham that his family will be as numerous as the stars in the heavens. Family imagery there connotes this belief in God when Abraham believes what God is telling him, that in Abraham's family, he's going to place a message of hope. From Abraham's family will come great nations and great kings. Generation after generation will come to be King David. And then generations after that will come until it all focuses at one wonderful point in time. The fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus. And then that promise explodes and bursts out into all the people that come after, all the people like you and me here today. No wonder the Psalm 22 says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Wow. Perhaps it's a picture of families worshiping God that John writes about in Revelation when Maria just read for us a minute ago. You know, Roger, the more I think about this, the more you may be right on what you're doing here. Uh, but I just thought of something. Did you guys, when you were working on the sermon, did you think about the fact that families in the Bible have problems? You know, families in the Bible have problems. Families fight. Spouses cheat. Children disobey their parents. Brother rises up against brother. Just think what Joseph's family did to him when they sold him off into slavery because they were jealous of him. Uh, I get your idea about families, Roger, but I don't know. In our world, families are a pretty flawed institution. Brothers and sisters in Christ, eh, maybe, but, you know, families are complicated. It's a complicated thing. Maybe, maybe what we should do today on Reformation Day is not talk about our identity as families, but talk about the other identities that we have. I mean, like, yeah, I know Moses was a brother to Pharaoh, but Moses was also a prince. He was a sheep herder. He was a prophet. And David, well, David was more than just a king. He was a dancer. He was a warrior. St. Paul was a tent maker. I, you get the idea. Maybe family isn't really the identity we should be focusing in on on Reformation Sunday. Because I have to tell you this, trying to pigeonhole us, Roger, into one homogenous group of people based on a greeting of brothers and sisters in Christ seems like it could be a little counterproductive to the idea of the Reformation that we're thinking about today. I mean, we got to know, we are not one homogenous group of people out here. In fact, just look at our culture. Look at our world. We are a lot more like the families that fight in the Bible than the families the psalmist sees worshiping God. 
That hit home to all of us in a pretty straightforward way last night or this morning when we heard about the shootings at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. See, on our culture, we still fight about religion, just like the people in the Bible did. We still fight about race. We still fight about social class and gender and roles and responsibilities. We segment people in our lives. We segment and label them into Mac or PC or Pepsi or Coke or based on the clothes they wear or the music that they like. I mean, people even fight about their favorite sports teams. In fact, when you get down to it, in our society, we do fight about our identity and their identity, the us's and the them's. In fact, the term identity politics has now become a cliche of sorts. From Supreme Court hearings to social media blogs to families to our coworkers to even our fellow members of our church, we segment people into slices of belief and behavior and image and ability and bank account. At times, it really does seem like we live in a world of us's and them's. And then we wrongly celebrate how happy we are that we're one of the us's and not one of the them's. Maybe when you start thinking about, maybe it's that kind of segmented, identity-driven, hierarchical self-righteousness that the Reformation actually causes us to rethink a little bit today. Because the Reformation, in a way, makes very clear that we really are one homogenous family, including all the people that we like and all the people that we don't like. No, it tells us that we all stand equal before God. We all have the same curse running through our hearts and our minds, and it shows every day in the actions of everyone around us. And it shows every day in our own actions as well. Paul says there's no significant difference among any of us because all have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God. We are all brothers and sisters in the same family, but it's the family of sin. And there's not a thing we can do about it. Harper Lee wrote in the literary masterpiece To Kill a Mockingbird, this. You can choose your friends, but you sure can't choose your family. And they're still kin to you no matter whether you acknowledge them or not. And it makes you look right silly when you don't. Even Martin Luther during the Reformation tried to choose his family. He beat himself bloody trying to stop sinning. He became some kind of a moral madman on a treadmill of confession. He once confessed for six hours straight, trying to probe into every nook and cranny of every conceivable sin, only to find that there were still more, <laughs> lots more. He found, as Jesus says in our gospel reading, that he was a slave to sin, no matter how hard he tried. He was still in the same boat as everybody else. Yeah, you can choose your friends, but you sure can't choose your family. The only one who can choose your family is Jesus. See, when told that his mothers and brothers were asking for him, Jesus responded by saying this, Who is my mother and who is my brother? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother, my family. And it is the will of God that you believe in Jesus Christ. He says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Folks, family creation applies to every one of us, the us's and the them's. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we leave one family, a family of misery and hopelessness and death, and we're born again 
into a brand new family of courage and compassion and life and grace. The Apostle John also writes in his gospel, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children. I guess that means brothers and sisters together. Do you ever think about the fact that the genealogy that you and I share is that our brother Jesus Christ willingly obeyed his father and went to the cross for you and me? He went and died for our empty prejudice. He went and died for our self-righteousness. He went and died for our own dysfunctional families so that by God's undeserved mercy, we could receive the very righteousness of God, Jesus' righteousness, and be brought into a circle of a forgiven family and faith based on what Jesus has done for you, so you could be his brother, his sister, his mother. Talk about identity. In the world of identities of us's and them's, Jesus simply comes and gives us his identity. Roger, I, I may owe you and Leland a bit of apology. I, I had no idea where you were going with all of this. Uh, see, I see that brothers and sisters in Christ is not some cliched, overused phrasing. It's not some secretive or compelling emotional image. It's one step closer to an even greater reality. It tells us that we've been called into Jesus' eternal family, a true spiritual family that brings us into the ultimate reality of God himself. And that's why Paul writes, who can boast? How can we boast? Jesus' identity takes away any moral superiority any of us can ever have. Now, of course we're going to have differences with each other. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up for what's true and right and decent and scriptural that we shouldn't speak our minds or exchange ideas, that we should somehow just ignore the truth or blindly declare that all religions are the same. But how we conduct ourselves matters because others see Jesus through us. I know because of our sinful nature, we're not going to be perfect. We're going to hurt other people and other people are going to hurt us. But that doesn't give us license to demean others, to inflame passions with misguided words, or to belittle someone else. In the midst of the Reformation, Martin Luther wrote the small catechism, and he said this, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him and explain everything in the kindest way. The pivotal point is that last sentence, explain everything in the kindest way. I always heard it put a different way, that we should put the best construction on everything. You know, maybe Leland was right, and Luther did grow up around a bunch of farms, because that kind of sounds like straight farm talk to me. And he gave us the farm story for you for today because he said, nobody wants to be like the farmer who plowed his field with a steamroller because he wanted to grow mashed potatoes. I guess what we're saying is the Reformation isn't something that happened back in the 1500s, and that was it. It continues today. It continues today because what was declared in the Reformation today still empowers all of us to meet each other just as Christ has come and met us, as Christ has met us in his word, as Christ has come and met us in those waters of baptism where we were forgiven and raised anew, as Christ comes and meets us when we receive him in bread and wine, and as Christ sends his Holy Spirit to work in us and through us to minister with grace in our words and our actions to others. When the writer of Hebrews says, keep on living as brothers, he doesn't mean we get to resemble brothers. He means that we all participate in the true family of God and that we're blessed to act accordingly. It takes work. It takes patience. But most of all, it takes the living God to come into our hearts and to change us 
and mold us into the people he calls us to be. It's not easy to see those whom we disagree with as children of God, but they are. One of the uh, early critics of Christianity was a guy named Lucian of Samosota. And back in 165 AD, he looked with disdain on all these Christians and this growing Christian faith. And he said, you know, their first teacher keeps teaching that they're all brothers of one another. This is exactly what he wrote. These deluded creatures, you see, have persuaded themselves that they are immortal and will live forever, which explains the contempt of death and willing self-sacrifice so common among them. It was impressed on them, too, by their lawgiver, that from the moment they are converted, they are to deny the gods of Greece, worship the crucified sage, and live after his laws. They are all brothers. They take his instructions completely on faith, with the result that they despise all worldly goods and hold them in common ownership. Folks, if that's not the bottom line, I don't know what is. As we gather on this Reformation Sunday, if it's really true that we can choose our friends, but we can't choose our family, then I, like you, have been greatly blessed by God. For it's a joy for me to look out and be able to call all of you my friends. But it's a living legacy, a living legacy of hope and promise that we can all call each other family my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen.